Section 7 at this moment the town of saumur was more excited about the dinner given by grandet to the cruchots than it had been the night before at the sale of his vintage though that constituted a crime of high treason against the whole wine-growing community if the politic old miser had given his dinner from the same idea that cost the dog of alcibiades his tail he might perhaps have been called a great man but the fact is considering himself superior to a community which he could trick on all occasions he paid very little heed to what saumur might say the des grassins soon learned the facts of the failure and the violent death of guillaume grandet and they determined to go to their client's house that very evening to commiserate his misfortune and show him some marks of friendship with a view of ascertaining the motives which had led him to invite the cruchots to dinner at precisely five o'clock m c de bonfons and his uncle the notary arrived in their sunday clothes the party sat down to table and began to dine with good appetites grandet was grave charles silent eugenie dumb and madame grandet did not say more than usual so that the dinner was very properly a repast of condolence when they rose from table charles said to his aunt and uncle will you permit me to retire i am obliged to undertake a long and painful correspondence certainly nephew as soon as the good man was certain that charles could hear nothing and was probably deep in his letter-writing he said with a dissimulating glance at his wife madame grandet what we have to talk about will be latin to you it is half-past seven you can go and attend to your household accounts good-night my daughter he kissed eugenie and the two women departed a scene now took place in which pere grandet brought to bear more than at any other moment of his life the shrewd dexterity he had acquired in his intercourse with men and which had won him from those whose flesh he sometimes bit too sharply the nickname of the old dog if the mayor of saumur had carried his ambition higher still if fortunate circumstances drawing him towards the higher social spheres had sent him into congresses where the affairs of nations were discussed and had he there employed the genius with which his personal interests had endowed him he would undoubtedly have proved nobly useful to his native land yet it is perhaps equally certain that outside of saumur the good man would have cut a very sorry figure possibly there are minds like certain animals which cease to breed when transplanted from the climates in which they are born m m m monsieur le president you said th that b b bankruptcy the stutter which for years the old miser had assumed when it suited him and which together with the deafness of which he sometimes complained in rainy weather was thought in saumur to be a natural defect became at this crisis so wearisome to the two cruchots that while they listened they unconsciously made faces and moved their lips as if pronouncing the words over which he was hesitating and stuttering at will here it may be well to give the history of this impediment of the speech and hearing of m grandet no one in anjou heard better or could pronounce more crisply the french language with an angevin accent than the wily old cooper some years earlier in spite of his shrewdness he had been taken in by an israelite who in the course of the discussion held his hand behind his ear to catch sounds and mangled his meaning so thoroughly in trying to utter his words that grandet fell a victim to his humanity and was compelled to prompt the wily jew with the words and ideas he seemed to seek to complete himself the arguments of the said jew to say what that cursed jew ought to have said for himself in short to be the jew instead of being grandet when the cooper came out of this curious encounter he had concluded the only bargain of which in the course of a long commercial life he ever had occasion to complain but if he lost at the time pecuniarily he gained morally a valuable lesson later he gathered its fruits 
indeed the good man ended by blessing that jew for having taught him the art of irritating his commercial antagonist and leading him to forget his own thoughts in his impatience to suggest those over which his tormentor was stuttering no affair had ever needed the assistance of deafness impediments of speech and all the incomprehensible circumlocutions with which grandet enveloped his ideas as much as the affair now in hand in the first place he did not mean to shoulder the responsibility of his own scheme in the next he was determined to remain master of the conversation and to leave his real intentions in doubt m, -m monsieur de bonfon for the second time in three years grandet called the cruchot nephew monsieur de bonfon the president felt he might consider himself the artful old fellow's son-in-law you said that b bankruptcy c could in some c cases b b be prevented b b by by the courts of commerce themselves it is done constantly said m c de bonfon bestriding grandet's meaning or thinking he guessed it and kindly wishing to help him out with it listen y yes said grandet humbly with the mischievous expression of a boy who is inwardly laughing at his teacher while he pays him the greatest attention when a man so respected and important as for example your late brother m -m my br br brother yes is threatened with insolvency they c call it insolvency yes when his failure is imminent the court of commerce to which he is amenable please follow me attentively has the power by a decree to appoint a receiver liquidation you understand is not the same as failure when a man fails he is dishonoured but when he merely liquidates he remains an honest man th th that's very d d different if it d d doesn't c cost m m more said grandet but a liquidation can be managed without having recourse to the courts at all for said the president sniffing a pinch of snuff don't you know how failures are declared n n no i n never th th thought answered grandet in the first place resumed the magistrate by filing the schedule in the record office of the court which the merchant may do himself or his representative for him with a power of attorney duly certified in the second place the failure may be declared under compulsion from the creditors now if the merchant does not file his schedule and if no creditor appears before the courts to obtain a decree of insolvency against the merchant what happens W -w -w what ha happens why the family of the deceased his representatives his heirs or the merchant himself if he is not dead or his friends if he is only hiding liquidate his business perhaps you would like to liquidate your brother's affairs ah grandet said the notary that would be the right thing to do there is honour down here in the provinces if you save your name for it is your name you will be a man a noble man cried the president interrupting his uncle certainly answered the old man my b -b brother's name was g -g grandet like m mine th -th that's a certain i, d I don't d deny it and th this l liquidation might be in m many ways very advantageous t to the interest of m my nephew whom i l love but i must consider i don't n know the t tricks of paris i b belong to so mure d d don't you see m m my vines my d d drains in, in short i've my own b b business i never c give n notes what are n n notes i t t take a good m many but i have never s signed one i d d don't understand such things i have heard that n n notes can be b b bought up of course said the president notes can be bought in the market less so much per cent don't you understand grandet made an ear trumpet of his hand and the president repeated his words well then replied the man there's something to be g -g got out of it i n know no, nothing at my age about such th things i l live here and l look after the v vines the vines g grow and it's the w wine that p pays look after the vintage that's my rule my ch chief interests are at foifon 
i c c can't l leave my house to muddle myself with a d devilish b business i know nothing about you say i ought to l liquidate my b brother's affairs to p prevent the failure i c c can't be in two p places at once unless i were a little b b bird and i understand cried the notary well my old friend you have friends old friends capable of devoting themselves to your interests all right thought grandet make haste and come to the point suppose one of them went to paris and saw your brother guillaume's chief creditor and said to him one m moment interrupted the good man said w what something l like this monsieur G grandet of saumur this monsieur grandet of saumur that he l loves his b brother he loves his n nephew grandet is a g good uncle he m m means well he has sold his vintage the don't declare of a failure c call a meeting l liquidate and then g g g grandet will see what he c can do b b better liquidate than l l let the l lost stick its n nose in eh? isn't it so exactly so said the president b b because don't you see monsieur de bonfon a man must l l look b b before he l leaps if you c can't you c can't b must know all about the m matter all the resources and the debts if you d don't want to be ru ruined eh? isn't it so certainly said the president i am of opinion that in a few months the debts might be bought up for a certain sum and then paid in full by an agreement ha <laughs> ha you can coax a dog a long way if you show him a bit of lard if there has been no declaration of failure and you hold a lien on the debts you come out of the business as white as the driven snow S -s snow said grandet putting his hand to his ear what about the snow but cried the president do pray attend to what i am saying i am attending a note is merchandise an article of barter which rises and falls in prices that is a deduction from jeremy bentham's theory about usury that writer has proved that the prejudice which condemned usurers to reprobation was mere folly Whew, ejaculated the good man allowing that money according to bentham is an article of merchandise and that whatever represents money is equally merchandise resumed the president allowing also that it is notorious that the commercial note bearing this or that signature is liable to the fluctuation of all commercial values rises or falls in the market is dear at one moment and is worth nothing at another the courts decide ah how stupid i am i beg your pardon i am inclined to think you could buy up your brother's debts for twenty-five per cent did you c c call him j j jeremy b b b ben bentham an englishman that's a jeremy who might save us a lot of lamentations in business said the notary laughing those englishmen s sometimes t t talk sense said grandet so c c according to ben bentham if my b brother's n notes are worth n nothing if j j j i'm c correct am i not that seems c c clear to my m m mind the, the c c creditors would be n no would not be i understand let me explain it all said the president legally if you acquire a title to all the debts of the maison grandet your brother or his heirs will owe nothing to any one very good very good good repeated grandet in equity if your brother's notes are negotiated negotiated do you clearly understand the term negotiated in the market at a reduction of so much per cent in value and if one of your friends happening to be present should buy them in the creditors having sold them of their own free will without constraint the estate of the late grandet is honorably released that's t -t true b -b -b business is b business said the cooper b -b but st still you know it is d -d -d difficult i have n no m money and no t -t time yes but you need not undertake it i am quite ready to go to paris you may pay my expenses they will only be a trifle i will see the creditors and talk with them and get an extension of time and everything can be arranged if you will add something to the assets so as to buy up all title to the debts 
we'll see about that i c can't and i w won't bind myself without he who c can't can't don't you see that's very true i'm all p put ab about by what you've t t told me this is the f first time in my life i have d been obliged to th th think yes you are not a lawyer i am only a p poor wine g grower and know n nothing about w what you have just t told me i m a must th think about it very good said the president preparing to resume his argument nephew said the notary interrupting him in a warning tone well what uncle answered the president let monsieur grandet explain his own intentions the matter in question is of the first importance our good friend ought to define his meaning clearly and a loud knock which announced the arrival of the des grassins family succeeded by their entrance and salutations hindered cruchot from concluding his sentence the notary was glad of the interruption for grandet was beginning to look suspiciously at him and the wen gave signs of a brewing storm in the first place the notary did not think it becoming in a president of the civil courts to go to paris and manipulate creditors and lend himself to an underhand job which clashed with the laws of strict integrity moreover never having known old grandet to express the slightest desire to pay anything no matter what he instinctively feared to see his nephew taking part in the affair he therefore profited by the entrance of the des grassins to take the nephew by the arm and lead him into the embrasure of the window you have said enough nephew you've shown enough devotion your desire to win the girl blinds you the devil you mustn't go at it tooth and nail let me sail the ship now you can haul on the braces do you think it right to compromise your dignity as a magistrate in such a he stopped for he heard monsieur des grassins saying to the old cooper as they shook hands grandet we have heard of the frightful misfortunes which have just befallen your family the failure of the house of guillaume grandet and the death of your brother we have come to express our grief at these sad events there is but one sad event said the notary interrupting the banker the death of monsieur grandet jr and he would never have killed himself had he thought in time of applying to his brother for help our old friend who is honourable to his finger-nails intends to liquidate the debts of the maison grandet of paris to save him the worry of legal proceedings my nephew the president has just offered to go to paris and negotiate with the creditors for a satisfactory settlement these words corroborated by grandet's attitude as he stood silently nursing his chin astonished the three des grassins who had been leisurely discussing the old man's avarice as they came along very nearly accusing him of fratricide ah i was sure of it cried the banker looking at his wife what did i tell you just now madame des grassins grandet is honourable to the backbone and would never allow his name to remain under the slightest cloud money without honour is a disease there is honour in the provinces right very right grandet i'm an old soldier and i can't disguise my thoughts i speak roughly thunder it is sublime the, the, then s sublime th things c cost d dear answered the good man as the banker warmly wrung his hand but this my dear grandet if the president will excuse me is a purely commercial matter and needs a consummate business man your agent must be some one fully acquainted with the markets with disbursements rebates interest calculations and so forth i am going to paris on business of my own and i can take charge of we'll see about t -t trying to m manage it b b between us under the p p peculiar c circumstances b b b but without b binding myself to anything that i c could not do said grandet stuttering because you see monsieur le president naturally expects me to pay the expenses of his journey the good man did not stammer over the last words eh cried madame des grassins why it is a pleasure to go to paris i would willingly pay to go myself she made a sign to her husband as if to encourage him in cutting the enemy out of the commission coute que coute. then she glanced ironically at the two cruchots who looked chapfallen 
Grandet seized the banker by a button and drew him into a corner of the room. "'I have a great deal more confidence in you than in the President,' he said. "'Besides, I have other fish to fry,' he added, wriggling his wen. "'I want to buy a few thousand francs in the funds while they are at eighty. They fall, I'm told, at the end of each month. You know all about these things, don't you?' "'Bless me. Then am I to invest enough to give you a few thousand francs a year?' that's not much to begin with hush i don't want any one to know i am going to play that game you can make the investment by the end of the month say nothing to the cruchots that'll annoy them if you are really going to paris we will see if there is anything to be done for my poor nephew well it's all settled i'll start to-morrow by the mail-post said des grassins aloud and i will come and take your last directions at what hour will suit you five o'clock just before dinner said grandet rubbing his hands the two parties stayed on for a short time des grassins said after a pause striking grandet on the shoulder it is a good thing to have a relation like him yes yes without making a show said grandet i am a g good relation i loved my brother and i will prove it unless it c c costs we must leave you grandet said the banker interrupting him fortunately before he got to the end of his sentence if i hurry my departure i must attend to some matters at once very good very good i myself in c -c consequence of what i told you i must retire to my own room and d -d -d deliberate as president cruchot says plague take him i am no longer monsieur de bonfon thought the magistrate ruefully his face assuming the expression of a judge bored by an argument the heads of the two factions walked off together neither gave any further thought to the treachery grandet had been guilty of in the morning against the whole wine-growing community each tried to fathom what the other was thinking about the real intentions of the wily old man in this new affair but in vain will you go with us to madame d'orsonval's said des grassins to the notary we will go there later answered the president i have promised to say good evening to mademoiselle de gribeaucourt and we will go there first if my uncle is willing farewell for the present said madame des grassins when the cruchots were a few steps off adolphe remarked to his father are not they fuming eh hold your tongue my son said his mother they might hear you besides what you say is not in good taste law school language well uncle cried the president when he saw the des grassins disappearing i began by being de bonfons and i have ended as nothing but cruchot i saw that that annoyed you but the wind has set fair for the des grassins what a fool you are with all your cleverness let them sail off on grandet's we'll see about it and keep yourself quiet young man eugenie will none the less be your wife in a few moments the news of grandet's magnanimous resolve was disseminated in three houses at the same moment and the whole town began to talk of his fraternal devotion every one forgave grandet for the sale made in defiance of the good faith pledged to the community they admired his sense of honor and began to laud a generosity of which they had never thought him capable it is part of the french nature to grow enthusiastic or angry or fervent about some meteor of the moment can it be that collective beings nationalities peoples are devoid of memory when pere grandet had shut the door he called nanon don't let the dog loose and don't go to bed we have work to do together at eleven o'clock cornoyer will be at the door with the chariot from foifon listen for him and prevent his knocking tell him to come in softly police regulations don't allow nocturnal racket besides the whole neighborhood need not know that i am starting on a journey so saying grandet returned to his private room where nanon heard him moving about rummaging and walking to and fro though with much precaution for he evidently did not wish to wake his wife and daughter and above all not to rouse the attention of his nephew whom he had begun to anathematize when he saw a thread of light under his door about the middle of the night eugenie intent on her cousin fancied she heard a cry like that of a dying person it must be charles she thought 
he was so pale so full of despair when she had seen him last could he have killed himself she wrapped herself quickly in a loose garment a sort of pelisse with a hood and was about to leave the room when a bright light coming through the chinks of her door made her think of fire but she recovered herself as she heard nanon's heavy steps and gruff voice mingling with the snorting of several horses can my father be carrying off my cousin she said to herself opening her door with great precaution lest it should creak and yet enough to let her see into the corridor suddenly her eye encountered that of her father and his glance vague and unnoticing as it was terrified her the good man and nanon were yoked together by a stout stick each end of which rested on their shoulders a stout rope was passed over it on which was slung a small barrel or keg like those pere grandet still made in his bakehouse as an amusement for his leisure hours holy virgin how heavy it is said the voice of nanon what a pity that it is only copper sous answered grandet take care you don't knock over the candlestick the scene was lighted by a single candle placed between two rails of the staircase cornoyer said grandet to his keeper in partibus have you brought your pistols no monsieur mercy what's there to fear for your copper sous oh nothing said pere grandet besides we shall go fast added the man your farmers have picked out their best horses very good you did not tell them where i was going i didn't know where very good is the carriage strong strong here to that now why it can carry three thousand weight how much does that old keg weigh goodness exclaimed nanon i ought to know there's pretty nigh eighteen hundred will you hold your tongue nanon you are to tell my wife i have gone into the country i shall be back to dinner drive fast cornoyer i must get to angers before nine o'clock the carriage drove off nanon bolted the great door let loose the dog and went off to bed with a bruised shoulder no one in the neighbourhood suspecting either the departure of grandet or the object of his journey the precautions of the old miser and his reticence were never relaxed no one had ever seen a penny in that house filled as it was with gold hearing in the morning through the gossip of the port that exchange on gold had doubled in price in consequence of certain military preparations undertaken at nantes and that speculators had arrived at angers to buy coin the old wine-grower by the simple process of borrowing horses from his farmers seized the chance of selling his gold and of bringing back in the form of treasury notes the sum he intended to put into the funds having swelled it considerably by the exchange.